Welcome everyone to um, the first AdAgra um, highlight video. We're gonna hopefully be doing these um, in the future, depending on how everyone likes it. But um, the idea of, of coming together is to highlight an initiative or something of interest that AdAgra finds that we would like to highlight and um, basically telling you guys about it, talking a little bit about the history and hopefully you find it as exciting as we do. And tonight, to kick us off with this um, series, I have uh, Mr. Darren Greenfield um, with me. And um, we're going to be talking about an initiative that he started that is under at Agra called the Garden of Renown. And he's going to tell us a little bit about how he got into that. But um, before, we, before we get into that a little bit, for, for, for those that you don't know, um, Mr. Greenfield, I met Mr. Greenfield at uh, Weimar um college i'm guessing it's still a college right mr greenfield and yes. um when i was like 15 or 16 or something like that and uh my mom's like i was really interested in farming at the time and he was very gracious to let me come up and we worked on a lot of projects together spent a lot of time driving in a car going to pick up different things and having great conversations um about everything from agriculture to education and um, I know his, his dedication and passion in agriculture, and I'm sure that's one of the big reasons that led him to get involved with this Garden of Renown thing that we're going to be talking about. But um, just to just kind of kick it off so that you kind of know a little bit more about Mr. Greenfield's background, I'm going to ask him to share a little bit about where he's from and, you know, how did he get to Weimar and, and then obviously move on to how he got involved with Garden of Renown and, and share with us um, about that project and, and what's going on there and how we might be able to get involved with it. Well, hello everyone. Thank you, Alan, for the opportunity to share tonight. Um, actually, if you listen to me for a couple of minutes, you'll say, yeah, you're from down under and you might guess uh, Australia, but no, I'm not from Australia, I'm from New <laughs> Zealand. And um, I've been here in the United States for more than half my life and I haven't shaken off the accent yet. So um, anyway. That's where I'm from, and I was blessed to, to have the formative years of my life growing up there in New Zealand. New Zealand is a, an agrarian country. We have a lot of agriculture, a lot of diversity in agriculture. And um, I, as a child, uh, my father, my uncle, and my grandfather had a farm, a thousand acre farm. They had sheep and cattle and about eight acres of kiwi fruit. And I loved it as a kid growing up, and all I wanted to do was farm. So I'm not going to go into all the details, but that's my background. Um, after conversion, I came to Weimar College. Uh, the Lord really changed my life. And um, after Weimar College, uh, just boiling it all down, I actually spent uh, seven years, nearly eight years in the ministry in Michigan Conference. And, um, and then was called to come back to Weimar Institute back in 2008 and uh, have been here ever since and uh, most of that time I've been involved in agriculture and and running the farm and I, I really feel blessed I think I have the best job on the whole, at the whole institute here and I get to work with a lot of young people I see God working in their lives I see lives changed and uh, it was um, seven years ago wasn't it Alan that we uh, the Lord led this organization Adagra mm -hmm. to get formed I was involved at the beginning of it and um, have been really blessed by it. And so giving a little bit of background into the Garden of Renown project, um, I have read through the different books, the compilations on agriculture, and I uh, was very interested in reading about the seventh year of rest of uh, the land and the comments Ellen White uh, mentioned about that and how uh, we should look at it that as, you know, God is the owner of the land and, and we're managing it and we should follow his directions. And anyway, I felt convicted to, to give the land a Sabbath rest. And um, so I did, and that was back in 2018. And um, so this is background to how the Garden of Renown started. Fair enough. At the time, I had been um, doing prison ministry on Sabbaths. And, you know, when you're busy uh, farming, you often feel like you uh, don't have a lot of time to really focus on ministry. And so Sabbath was an opportunity to do that for me. And, 
So I was in the prison and we were studying with people and we had a service, an Adventist service there in Folsom Prison. And um, while doing that, um, I actually it was baptizing people there and uh, baptized a, a number of uh, black uh, individuals. And it just, the thought went through my head. You're working with a lot of, uh, a lot of black people and um, I had been to um, Jamaica several times to uh, speak at their agricultural conference and to be involved there. And it just went through my head just as a passing thought. And then the Lord just impressed upon me quite strongly. I have a work for you to do with the black people. And I, um, I just, you know, didn't really give it much thought. But that was right at the end of 2017. So 2018 came around and I had been to Zambia before on a mission trip with our academy and there was a pastor there that I knew and he contacted me and said, please come over and hold some meetings. We're doing a, um, throughout my, my district, we're having meetings at most churches and we'd like for you to come and, and bring some people and, and preach. So I took several individuals with me, um, another four, and so there was five of us, and we got involved in that, um, and the Lord really blessed with that. And I came back and I thought, well, you know, part of the Lord's um, intention for the farmer having a seventh year rest was to get involved in mission work. And so I thought, well, I've done my mission work. Well, I got called two more times to go to Africa that I didn't expect. And one was to Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. And uh, then the next one was to uh, Ghana. And um, so when I went to Ghana, I, I went to the Adventist University there and, and had a look at two, two of their different sites at what they were doing with agriculture. And they wanted me to make some recommendations. So I did that. Anyway, um, to basically cut a long story short, I ended up going back, I've, I think I've been five times now to Ghana and um, been involved uh, uh, with forming the Adventist Agricultural Association there. And they've had two conferences. Um, the Lord is really blessed and the church unions and conferences have really embraced um, ADAGRA and they're um, doing quite a bit with it there and it's impacting um, God's work in the church. And so um, part of what we, we did was we actually, um, I think it was back in Oregon, when we had our conference here mm -hmm. on the West Coast, there was one of the Ghanaian uh, pastors that was attending. What and was his, name? Uh, his name was Pastor I.B. Pastor I.B., yeah, okay. And, yeah. and so he actually uh, made a, a little appeal asking if anybody had a tractor or equipment that, uh, that if they would be willing to donate it to help out their work there at the university. Well, uh, a man came forward and, and actually did donate a tractor. And um, so in the process of, do, of getting that over to Ghana, we end up uh, filling up a 40 foot container with another tractor that Weimar donated and, um, and a whole bunch of agricultural implements and resources and things for them as well as medical um, resources so we filled that container to the almost to the top and we shipped that over there and um, so I ended up I was going over there to meet the container to unload it and um, help show them how to use the tractors because they didn't know how to use tractors <laughs> and uh, anyway um, the the actual ship came in a week late so I had a week of time up my sleeve and I thought what am I going to do and I don't like being idle I like to be busy doing things and uh, I was praying about it and then I ended up going and spending that week with another pastor who was really um, convicted and on fire for agriculture and so when I spent that week with him um, I was taken around to show different Adventists who were farming and to see what they were doing. And while I was there, I was reading through um, uh, Ezekiel. And as I was reading through Ezekiel, uh, this verse just jumped out at me that really uh, caught my attempt, attention. And it was Ezekiel 34, 19, I believe it is. And it says, 
or it might, I, I might have the verse wrong, but anyway, I'll put it up on the screen later. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, it was God speaking and he says, I will raise up for them a garden of renown and there shall no longer be hunger in the land. And when I, I read that, it really hit me to think that, um, you know, God would raise up a garden himself, you know, and, and that it would feed the hungry people. Now, in most African countries, you see a lot of poverty and um, Ghana, uh, while there are pockets of affluence there in the northern region and, and different regions of the country, there's a lot of poverty. And um, in fact, a pastor told me who works in the very north region where there's a lot of Muslims and low rainfall and uh, so on, that there's so much poverty there that in their churches that usually the only person that has employment is usually a school teacher that's employed by the government and that 90 some percent of their uh, members are unemployed. And that means that they usually try to grow something when they do have rain, which is a short time of the year. And they've got to basically live off what they can grow during that time. So I was, um, it, it kind of struck me as I was studying that verse and reading the context that um, the context of it is actually maybe now is a good time to bring up the uh, screen share and just show the verse yeah. here. Um, yeah, here we go. Got some, Mr. Greenfield's got some great pictures here to show you guys. So yeah. So uh, anyway, um, this Garden of Renown project, yeah, Ezekiel thirty four twenty nine. It wasn't nineteen, but uh, God says, "I will raise up for you a garden of renown, and they shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land." There's Pastor Ivy who attended the uh, Oregon conference there visiting our now, farm and just a question uh, on that yes. picture with pastor ivy um yes. i remember you sending me a video on whatsapp of basically people putting in tomato plants are yes. these those tomato plants producing no, that, that, that's at weimar farm he oh this is us. that oh that's right okay there's pine trees there i'm sorry I, <laughs> so he came and visited you after yes. the conference or in the uh, no it was an, another trip i think it might have been the same time. I can't remember. No, it can't have been because the conference was in January. And when yeah. he came to visit us, it was in October. Did he, and, so he uh, came to Weimar then for something? Yes, he came to Weimar, visit us there. It was when we were loading, beginning to load the shipping container. Oh, so okay. Came. Okay. So um, he was very impressed with all the tomato production. And that's when he asked me to come over and, and hold a class on growing tomatoes. Makes and, sense. Okay. He was so excited with these tomatoes. <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, here's the context to that Garden of Renown verse, uh, Ezekiel 34, 29. You go back a couple of verses and God says, I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. So what is God's hill? Well, uh, in, in Psalms 99 verse 9, it says, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. So the whole, the, the, the God's holy hill or his hill is the place of worship, a church, you could say. And so when I'm reading this, I'm saying, okay, God says, I will make them, that them has to be the church members and the places all around my hill a blessing. How's he going to do that? Well, he goes on and he says, I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. We have a song, you know, that we sing, showers of blessing, you know, mm -hmm. that's where it comes from. And then it says, then as a result of this blessing, then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit and the earth shall yield her increase. So how is God's people going to be a blessing? How is this church going to be a blessing? It's through agriculture. It's through his church using agriculture and his blessing upon agriculture that then they can minister to their community and uh, they can make a big difference. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, um, that really got me excited. We need to get the churches involved and have some agriculture going on around these churches that are in poverty. And um, part of their reason for poverty is they don't have water to grow with. So they need wells. And um, so as I inquired about wells and the cost of wells and, and started looking into it, it looked very feasible to me. So we um, started this uh, project and um, 
I'll just you mention, mention this. This one uh, here. Yes, this, this, about. this is actually um, Ellen White at Avondale, and she's talking about the. So I'm just trying to. Whoops, let's go back. Part of the screen is blocked by look at your picture on it. Oh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, um, she says there, she says, but the light given me is that all that section of land from the, and I can't read it because it's school. Blocked, you want school me to read it? Orchard to the Maitland Road and extending on both sides of the road from the meeting house, the church, to the school should become a farm and a park beautified with fragrant flowers and ornamental trees. There should be orchards and every kind of produce should be cultivated that is adapted to the soil. Why? That this place may become an object lesson to those living close by and afar off. So I knew this, this, uh, this statement here because I studied uh, Avondale College fairly thoroughly to, to understand the council and to uh, understand God's plan. And so when I started seeing that in the Bible in Ezekiel, this passage came to my mind and I thought, wow, this is a perfect fit. This is really, you know, God's model of how he's going to bless and reach the communities uh, with, with his message. So question so, that, would it be fair to say then, obviously this is being, you're, you're, you're leading up to how you're implementing this in Ghana, but it almost yes. seems like from that quote, this could be a broader implementation for God's people in any context almost. Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, um, just recently, there was an article in the Pacific Union rec uh, Recorder mm -hmm. of the church in Templeton, I think it is, that uh, started a uh, farm at their church. And during the COVID lockdown, that was the hit because people in the community came and, and they were able to minister to them through that when everybody else is locked down and, and so on. And so it's been a huge success. I think we haven't seen anything yet of what God can do through agriculture and as people taking hold of the council and, and doing what, you know, these things, these types of things. Do you know so, where Templeton Church is? Um, I haven't visited there, but I think it's over uh, towards the Bay, Silicon Valley. Yeah. That'd be interesting to reach out to those people. Maybe they would be a, a neat interview in the future. Anyways, I'm just putting that out there. Yeah, yeah I think that'd be fantastic. Um, and with our conference coming up in, in uh, January in California, that'll be a right. hit too. We'll have them come and share what they're doing. Okay. So <laughs> anyway, um, so as we got the ball rolling and, and started to, we, we got one site going as far as putting in the well at the church and then, you know, getting ready for them to put agriculture as part of that and fencing it and so on. And I was there this, this last November mm -hmm. and uh, I traveled to some remote regions of the country where um, there was a lot of poverty and, and seemed like the need was really great. So we're traveling. Um, we, we had to fly to the northern region and then drive for a whole day. It was a long drive and we were saddle sore from sitting all the way in bouncy rough roads and so on. And we're driving along the road and you know, the roads out there in the country are just dead straight, just straight as an arrow. Really? And, yet, and, and, and yeah, sometimes for miles, because the land's not, you know, hilly in, in many of those. Yeah, places. it looks pretty flat in this picture. Yeah. So anyway, we are driving along and then all of a sudden the road makes this, this sudden veer. And as, as we make this veer for no reason, there's the sign that says the mystic st stone. And I said to them, what's, all the, what's this mystic stone all about? And they said, oh, there's, there's some uh, um, history behind that. And I said, why don't we stop and have a look? Because it's, you know, it looked like some kind of uh, feature that was being, there, being mm -hmm. uh, uh, advertised there. So we stopped and we went and had a look. So here is this Muslim man and he explained, here they had this mystic stone sitting there up on a, on a pedestal pedestal looking like a mushroom and uh, and it was all fenced in and everything and this man gave the history of the stone now if that road had not made a veer to the right and then back you know around and come straight again it would have come straight through the stone so he said that when they were building the road that um, this stone was it was a big bigger than normal stone that was there you know where they were clearing the road and so they pushed it off to the side and, you know, making the road. And then the next day they came 
and uh, the stone was back in the middle of the road and they you know cleared it and and the stone just kept get going just miss uh magically just appearing in the, in the road anyway to cut a long story short and i don't remember all the specific details but the muslims in the area um, explained to the road workers and so on that this was allah who was doing this and they weren't to build the road through this was a special stone and um, so the road actually had to be formed around this mystic stone why am i telling this story um, i don't know <laughs> tell the story because i want you to get a picture in the northern part of, of ghana there's a huge muslim in, uh, influence now this stone and this miracle that was worked with the stone resulted in that whole area, that whole town is basically Muslim because they see, saw the magic of this stone and the story behind it and they put their faith in the Muslim religion because of that. So this is the, the types of um, you know, challenges that the Adventist church has is with trying to enter these areas and raise up churches because the Muslims really, it's sub-Saharan and the Muslims have a foothold there you know, in a big way. So we drove past the stone and we finally, after a long drive, we arrived at the Jarapa Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the pastor lived fairly close to this church and it was one of, I think, six churches that he had in his district. And in the northern region there, the churches are spaced fairly far apart because there's not many Adventists up there and they have a hard time reaching the people. And... Um, so we went to look at the site for a Garden of Renown project. And um, while we were there, we um, looked, they had plenty of land around the church. I think they had at least two acres that they could cultivate. This is an and, English speaking country. I just noticed the signs were all in English. Yes, although not everyone speaks English. <laughs> they have a number of different um, you know, languages throughout the country. Uh, so here's a group of uh, some of them pastors, some of them are elders for the church and so on. And we're meeting at this Jarapa Adventist Church. And um, we explained to them the Garden of Renown project and they're very excited about it. And um, the reason why they're excited about this is because they not only have poverty, but water is a really, uh, you know, clean water is a, is a rare commodity for them. And I saw there that many women and children are carrying buckets of water some distance. Some people that have money will put in a well and sell water and that becomes their business. And so um, to have water supply there is, is just, you know, something that they are very excited about. And so here you can see just this last week at this very church that I just showed you the pictures, they texted me this little video because they the well was was installed, the well is pumping water, and the whoever the man was, I don't even know who he was, that um, took this video, you can hear his excitement and he's singing the praises of Adagra uh, for putting in this well there at their church. So I'll just let it play. Adagra bowl, Adagra. Yum, boom, 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 Hallelujah, boom, sing, kude, boom, 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 sing, kude. This one is the work of uh, Kings Ford and the team. Boom, sing, kude, yin, yam, yam. So anyway, you can see that they're very excited. They found water. They actually got water. That's not always a guarantee. Water. And, uh, you know, it's pumping out a reasonable amount. I think looking by the flow, they've probably got 15, 16 gallons a minute is my guess. Maybe more. It's not bad. And um, now they can start growing through their dry season, which is actually the majority of the year in the northern region. And so um, that uh, they sent me another picture that they're starting to put up a little structure where they can uh, raise their seedlings and then be able to plant them out. What and, does a well cost? Are you going to get to that later on in the slide? Yes, yes, okay. we'll get to that uh, as well. So I'm just kind of taking you on a, a little bit of a journey that we went on back in November. We came to the second church on our way back on the long drive back. This church, we had to go on a rough little road to get to this church, and it was um, seemed to be way out of out of the way. And um, the story behind this church, one of the pastors, actually the pastor that visited us in Oregon, he actually 
several years back, I think it was, mm, not sure if it was eight or more years ago, it could have been 12 years ago, he went to the, this location and he held some evangelistic meetings, baptized a, a group of people, and they ended up um, uh, building this church. And I think he actually raised some money to help them build this church. And it's in a, a also maybe a poorer region than the other one uh, in Jirapa. And uh, we visited this church to see if we could um, put in a garden of renown here as well. And um, when we left this church and we were driving out, um, there was a beautiful Methodist church not far from it. Like it was really, it was modern and, you know, it wasn't like that it was big, but it was obviously there was some money that went into it. And then they told me that the Catholic Church um, there has a nice church and, and the, the Catholic Church and the Methodist Church are growing. And I said, well, how come they're growing and the Adventist Church is not growing? Well, they said, well, the Adventist Church, they preach, but they don't really get the um, converts from their preaching. But the Methodists and the Catholics are actually, they have agricultural projects and they employ and teach agriculture to the people and they convert over to their churches and so their churches are growing and I thought wow that's exactly what we need to be doing as an Adventist church the people don't want to necessarily hear the preaching they want something that's going to change their lives and help them and, and uh, be a blessing to them so by putting in this garden of renown at this church, they also have, I, I believe, five acres or something like that um, adjacent to this church that they can cultivate. Part of the garden of renown project, the funds that go to this project actually not only put in a well, but it uh, provides money for fencing and also um, money for some irrigation materials as well and then they can start growing as they have water to, to grow um, produce now it's really it really blew my mind how cheap it is to do this um, for five thousand dollars we can actually pay for a well to be drilled pay for fencing and for irrigation materials and um, i mean in a lot of locations in africa other countries that i've been to It'll cost you all of $5,000 just to drill a well, let alone put in a fence and some uh, infrastructure. So what type uh, of fence are we talking about? What sort of what, sorry? What type of fence are we talking about? Just curious. Well, the one that I saw them put in at uh, another church, which um, this is the same church and it's just showing the land. It's all overgrown. I have to clear it a bit. But um, And you were there in November, you said? November, yeah. So at this particular church here at Nkwami, um, we had this well installed before I actually went over. So this was our first project and um, they don't have a big amount of land at this church. I think half an acre is about the area they can cultivate. But um, this was our pilot project just to, you know, see what the expenses were going to be and, and, and give it a trial. Mm. Um, so... Um, I think I didn't answer your question before. What did you ask? Oh, I, I was just curious on what type of fencing. Are we talking like an eight foot fence or a six foot? So you can't see it in this picture because I don't know if they had got much of it installed when this picture was taken, but they actually use concrete posts that uh, they're, I guess they're relatively inexpensive for them compared with wood. Uh, the only posts I believe they use over there are teak because they're durable and mm. teak quite valuable they use them for their power poles um, but anyway they they put the concrete posts and then they have wire netting that you know that goes around okay. and, and if you've been to Africa in these places you'll see sheep and goats that just wander freely around you know and so anything you put out to start growing is going to get mowed down by them so uh, fences is essential so basically you at this particular um, pilot program, it's interesting how God led with the development of, of this project because initially my idea was let's put in the well and, um, and then you know provide what they need to start growing food. Well, as I was thinking about it and having been in Africa and knowing that you know water was an issue, they explained to me that for baptisms, 
fresh water is really a challenge. Um, the creeks that they have there are very polluted and they said it's not safe for human health to actually get in them. Um, the pastor that you see in the picture there that has his, his uh, mask hanging around his, his uh, chin there, mm -hmm. he said that he was doing a baptism in the creek and they could smell and feel human feces in the water. And another pastor told me that um, the, there's a lot of illegal gold um, mining that goes on and they use chemicals to, uh, I don't know, to extract the gold somehow. And those chemicals get in their creeks and, and uh, it's very toxic. So um, they, the need for clean water for baptisms became apparent to me. And so I said, you know, and I was, I was trying to think, how can we do something that's inexpensive that can be uh, replicated throughout the country, you know, that, that's not going to cost a lot of money. So my concept originally was um, let's use plastic water tanks, which they have over there. Let's cut the lid off it. We can put a concrete ring around the top so that it holds its shape and everything and make the lid so it's removable, you know, and, and, um, and then make a ladder that can go down into the water. And when they do baptisms, they can use the tank that they would pump the irrigation water out of as a baptismal tank. And that was my solution. Well, Pastor Ivy um, got involved and he said, you know, um, that's not gonna work well for us over here because he said, we often will baptize a hundred people at a time. And he said to go down a ladder into like that and out it'll take forever to do it. He said, we need a, a baptismal tank where they can walk in one end and walk out the other end and we can have the people flow through. And so he said, I think we can build it for um, a few hundred dollars more than the cost of the plastic tank. And I said, well, if that's the case, go ahead, do it. And um, originally they were gonna build a 10 by 10 baptismal tank uh, of concrete and tile it. And uh, they ended up doing a 10 by 20 and it cost about two and a half thousand dollars to build it. But I'll move to that slide. It was a beautiful um, baptismal tank and it looked like a swimming pool. I mean, it, they use swimming pool tile in it and for two and a half thousand dollars, it was an absolute bargain. And the, the beauty of the, the Garden of Renown is we actually are providing funds to buy the materials and the cost, but we don't pay for the labor. We don't you know. The church actually, they have uh, often, they build everything out of concrete. So the, a lot of people know how to do masonry and they know how to lay concrete and blocks and tile and that sort of thing. So if the church provides that, we provide the funding and it keeps the cost down really low and they're invested in it as well as us. And so there's a lot of a lot more buy-in to it when, when that happens. So anyway, this, this tank was installed and it was finished in time for them to have a baptism while we were still there. And the next slide here shows them having the, the baptism um, so um, I'm going to go uh, end the screen share now and just talk a little bit more about the project. So basically, um, that baptismal tank, I did not know that um, there was such a need for, for baptistries there. That uh, particular site that I believe in God's providence was selected for the first site was central to the conference that that is part of. And the conference president came and visited the site while I was there. And, and I talked to him and he said this uh, baptismal tank is such a blessing. He said, this tank is going to be shared by a hundred churches. He said, they churches. will bus and truck, truck the people in from other churches to have this clean water to baptize. And he said, this is going to get a lot of use. And they were so grateful for this. So, you know, we started out with a vision for agriculture being you know, done at the uh, church and that this would be a blessing to the community. Well, yes, it will be. A blessing to the community and they believe that it's going to help them with soul winning but um, not only is it going to help them with soul winning but
but as the people come in, they've got somewhere clean to baptize them. And, and mm -hmm. that's also, you know, a huge blessing. So I think Ezekiel 34, um, 29 is, is being fulfilled through this garden of renown. God is doing an amazing thing there to, to really help and bless the people. Um, there's several, there's one more project. I didn't show you pictures that is a school. It's an admission school. Um, I didn't uh, have in Ghana. A, yeah, in Ghana, and it's on the east side, close to another uh, country, a French-speaking country, and I've forgotten the name of that country right now. But if you look it up on, uh, uh, look at a map of Africa and see Ghana, the one on the west. Uh, it's really close to that border, and um, it's a conference that's a mission conference. And the way that they told me they work over there because it's really hard for them to get converts. What they do is they start schools to educate the young people, the children. And when they educate the children, um, it doesn't necessarily win that many souls while they're uh, educating the kids, but the kids grow up. And when they become independent themselves of their families, many of them become Adventists because they're so grateful for the education and the blessing they receive from the Adventist church. But because their parents won't allow them to become Adventists while they're kids. They have to wait till they're independent. So mm. um, this school is a mission school. And if you saw the pictures of it, I wish I could show you. It just, the school is basically just a, a rusty metal uh, tin roof with some pillars, dirt floor, very primitive, primitive desks. And, you know, it's really, really, you can see the poverty. It's really... Um, apparent and the conference president when he heard about the garden of renown um, he begged for their school to be a site for this and so he he uh, he asked and pastor ivy presented it to me and i said i i think that would be a great uh, place to have it so anyway they we hadn't even said yes to it at that point and the kids in the school went out just hearing about the possibility of, of their site being a, a garden of renown site. Um, they went out and they cleared, a, I believe it was about a hectare of land around the school. They cleared it, you know, and, and cleaned it up ready for a garden to go in. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, this, this place is really um, going to do something with it. So they have their well in already. Um, they've worked the soil they're ready to plant. And uh, so as we speak now, they're probably planting. Um, so the well's whatever. already dug then? The well is in. I saw pictures of the well. It's already in. And and I saw the pictures of them drilling it and the water was just gushing out. I think it's going to be a, a fairly high high producing well that they, they have there. So um, that's going to be a huge blessing. And they are very interested in the Adagra agricultural curriculum. They want to be able to use that at that school. So um, Adagra is gonna be a huge blessing um, to many parts of God's field, not just in Ghana, but I believe in other developing countries and developed countries, uh, but developing countries seem to be more open to agriculture than the developed countries. So I'm just excited with what God is doing and I, I just feel very, blessed and privileged to um, participate in this and and, and um, you know it 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 wasn't my dream or my idea it's like God just through circumstances um, has just revealed you know this project and we're just trying to follow his lead and so um, there have been different ones who have heard about this project and ex are excited about it too that have contributed money and um, we have funds nearly enough now to start a fifth one. The country of Ghana has 16 regions, 16 um, regions of the country, and the goal of Adagra Ghana is to plant one of these in each one of the regions to kind of show the people there, you know, what it's about, and then get the church members excited about it, and then hopefully, you know, we can um, help them put in more of them, especially in the areas where it really makes a big impact. So um, that's so, the story behind Garden of Renown. So six regions, and then obviously I imagine several, there's probably other schools that you didn't even mention that would be interested in something like this. 
So yes. just a curiosity question. So in these places in these, um, so the fifth one is, is at the, I'm sorry, we have four at churches currently, correct? One at a school. Three at, three at churches and one at a school. So we have what four total. Fifth one. You're about to do a fifth one. Okay. Yes. Um, so how, um, how uh, in the, and it might be a little too soon to tell, but I'm just curious um, at the, at the churches that have already gotten this, especially the ones that have the, like the pilot area and stuff, are they already like setting up a, a, a small garden in that area? How, how does the church uh, interact with, with it so far? How's that going? Well, I haven't actually seen uh, much in the way of pictures of actual real plants growing. I saw one picture where they had some tomatoes, um, didn't look like on any scale yet. Um, but this is developing as we're speaking, you know, the wells have only just gone in and, um, and the last picture I got was them setting up their, their little structure to start their seedlings in. Um, they have to provide shade for their seedlings because you know, these, these little seedlings come up in their hot um, sun, you know, Ghana is on the equator and it's pretty hot there. And so um, they have to sh put some shade over them and so on. So they were setting that up just this last week. They sent me the text uh, showing the picture there in Jirapa. And uh, the other church, I haven't seen any pictures that the well has been drilled there, the second church that I showed you the picture of. Mm -hmm. um, but... Um, that should be going in. These are in remote places, so even just to get a truck there to, to drill, you know, is uh, is a is a bit of a mission. I but, mean, I um, even know, like here in the U.S., I mean, our family started a farm uh, uh, four years ago now, and we basically took an entire year off to transition mm -hmm. from one location to the other. You know, to get your well in, to get your infrastructure put into place, and all that kind of stuff. I can only imagine. I mean that's here where we have the convenience that we can just run down on a nice paved road to a to a uh, yeah. hardware store, right? If we forgot a part and over there, like I, I imagine that's a lot more difficult. Yeah, things are a bit more challenging there. So it's probably going to take at least a year to uh, at least a year, I'd imagine, to get these things wound up, if not a little bit more, just considering how challenging it is even, you know, to shift a farm here in the U.S. from a from a raw yes. to to something that's more established. I would anticipate uh, seeing some results by the end of this year because um, right now they're in their, they're going into their wet season. Um, and then when they come out of their wet season is when the, the well is really going to be coming into its own. Uh, I'm sure they'll put in some crops once they have the fencing in, you know, um, during the wet season because the rain will irrigate. But um, meanwhile, they can be setting up everything ready so that when the dry season comes, Food prices are really high during the dry season. And uh, so they can grow food, they can actually sell some and that will help bring some funds in. Um, some of the, you know, they need money to run their churches and the people don't have offerings, but don't have money to, to give. They're just poor, so poor. And um, in fact, one pastor told me, he says, when we win a soul in this North region, he says it puts a hardship on the church because everybody is so needy that we have to help them and we don't have the money to even help them you know so putting in this garden that can help them they can also sell water and i think what excites me about the well and and them being able to distribute water um, to the people in the community is that as people come and get their water from the church um, and and you know get water that's necessary for life they can be introduced to the water of life, Jesus Christ. And they and is can that be, going to be a free service or are they charging a little bit to help pay for electricity or how have you? They, they plan to sell it okay. um, and people are very willing to buy it because it is in short supply. Um, what I have encouraged uh, them to do is to follow what the Bible teaches about taking care of widows and orphans and the needy people so they can you know earn money from those who have money to give but not neglect the needy people because that's part of their outreach as a church so as part of the garden of renown we teach them that you know this is not just you know financial arrangement here this is for you to be a, a blessing and we have developed what's called an mou memorandum of understanding so the church signs on to it and you know they they're educated into the purpose and what we're 
intending to accomplish with this project. And um, so that's, yeah, that's very clear to them that this is to be a blessing. They're not going to just give it away free because that's, you know, yeah, they're going to probably have to cover some expenses as well. But that's, I mean, obviously you're bringing in a resource and, you know, one of the things, um, one of the interesting things that I've noticed about, especially um, mission work that's done in, uh, in countries that might not have as much natural resources, whether for whatever reason that might be, a lot of time, a lot of times mission work is done just like, oh, we want to make these people Western, you know, or mm -hmm. we want to give them all the conveniences when, when in reality, um, you know, as Christians, it's not just about making sure people have water, but like you were saying, you know, they're using it as a ministry opportunity, which is, which is, you know, is, is living the, it's just relaying the, the, um, the values that Christianity has, right? Um, mm -hmm. kind of like, well, you talked about the seven years, right, of rest, but, you know, also in Levitical law, it talks a lot about how if they're, if there's someone that's going through your field and they're hungry, they can, they mm -hmm. can glean from the land. And it's just a spirit of generosity, um, mm -hmm. that is really found throughout Levitical law for the most part, um, mm -hmm. that is in your, your, uh, MOU, you said, or maybe, a, yeah. MOU, MOU, yeah. um, which, yeah. which, which is really neat. Yeah, and the, the whole, you know, the whole purpose of God giving them those those laws was for them to demonstrate the character of God. You know, that's what God is like. He cares for those people, you know, and um, so he makes provision for them. And it's interesting as you as you read those Levitical laws and you see that at, through the feast days, as they came, you know, uh, they were together together, um, you know, each year at the end of the, the harvest and all of that, that... Um, they were to come and rejoice before the Lord and celebrate and that the stranger, the widow, the orphans and everybody was to come and rejoice before the Lord. And the reason why they all had reason to, to rejoice is because if God's people were doing what he said, then everyone was blessed. Mm. And that's the purpose of this garden of renown is, is the church becomes that blessing that demonstrates the character of God and when people see what God is like, they're attracted to him and they'll listen, they'll, they'll hear his message and respond and want to be part of the remnant church. So that's, that's the purpose of the Garden of Renown. That's great. So, so looking forward, right? You mentioned that you want to do 16 of these. So, I mean, are, are you strategically putting the, the, the three that you already have and the fifth one that you're wanting to put in, not including, not counting the, the school, are... Um, have you already found the other, what is that, 11, 11 locations that you want to do it at if, if funds come in to, to be able to proceed after those 16 are done? Is that just too far out to really project on right now, or, or what are your thoughts? I, when I left Ghana, we had the conversation about you know that being the goal, and um, the Adagra team over there, their job was to identify the sites. And uh, I haven't had the conversation with them yet to find out, you know, have they identified the sites? So now that there's nearly enough money for a fifth site, I'm going to be communicating with them and saying, okay, where, you know, where are the, where's the next site? Where's the needy site? And, um, you know, find out where we can initiate the next project. And so, you know, when it comes to these projects and so forth, some people ask me questions about, you know, financial accountability and that sort of thing. Um, we actually have an auditing um, process. All the money that is sent over there goes through the Adventist University and then is given to Adagra Ghana. Um, and then from there, we know what the fixed costs are for the drilling of the well and these these various things so in the mou once they drill well the money is given to the church so that they can drill the well when that is completed and installed then another sum of money is given to them to put the fencing in and once that has been installed then the money for the irrigation uh, infrastructure is given to them and so it's given in three allocations um, the reason for that is my experience has shown me that uh, if you give it to them all in one piece, they 
use their discretion to for things that they think are maybe more important than what the intention is and they might use it for something that is important to them but it's not necessarily what the funding is intended to be used for and that's um you know it's just to eliminate that possibility of happening um but it can happen like you have Sounds like you have good quality people over there in the university to work with, and and that's really neat that you're actually being able to tie in with the uh, with the organized church over there, um, mm -hmm. so effectively. Um, yes, sounds like you have yeah, a lot of good are, people there. Very excited about Adagra. They really see Adagra as a huge blessing to their country, and and um, they're already having regional conferences. I, they sent me a picture just recently of. Uh, it must have been a couple of hundred people at a conference um, that was just in a, 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 you know, just a small part of the country. Um, and they were training the members in agriculture and they had, uh, they've identified now through Adagra different Adventists with expertise that are very well educated. And some of them have been, you know, high up in government positions overseeing agricultural development and and there's a there's some really good knowledge there that um, that helps them, and so they're harnessing that expertise. And these individuals are very willing to to go and travel to different regions and do training to to uh, help God's people. Do you so, think? Um, and this is just a curiosity question because obviously we're starting out kind of these interviews highlighting stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Do you? You think there's a possibility of maybe bringing Pastor Ivy on and, and and having a little talk with him on Zoom? Does he have would he have access to to do that maybe in the future? I'm just throwing out ideas. We sure can. Okay, super. So just to kind of wrap this up, so you're saying that it's five thousand dollars, you know, per um, um, per site. Um, yes. Obviously, you have a, at least tentatively right now, the scope is roughly 11 more sites, 12 more sites somewhere in there. Um, how would someone go about um, getting the funds to you or to wherever that needs to go so that it then can be transported over there and this, and this work can continue over in Ghana? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, this is an Adagra initiative. It's not my initiative. You know, it's, it's God's initiative and Adagra is the vehicle through which he's, you know, enabling this to happen. So anyone that's interested in, in contributing and sponsoring, um, it does, you know, even $20 can help, but um, uh, a lot of people have given a hundred, some people have given 500, 1,000, 1,500, two, two and a half, you know, and, and so uh, different amounts, whatever anyone wants to give can go through a dagger and you can probably share how they can yeah um, well, send, just earmark it put on the memo of the check that it's for the garden of renown so that it goes to the right place um the five thousand dollars actually doesn't cover the baptistry if if there's a site that is central to a district that they could really use a baptistry we need about another two and a half thousand dollars to put the same kind of baptistry that you saw. We could probably do it a bit cheaper than that for a smaller one. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, but that is also a very worthy, um, you know, project to sponsor because of the need there. In fact, another little story: one pastor in the north region there, he said, you know, see, we're scared to to baptize people in in water holes because in the northern region they have crocodiles and uh, <laughs> they're scared of the water in case they get eaten by a crocodile <laughs> while they're baptizing so um he that particular pastor was very excited about the prospect of getting a baptismal tank i'm sure uh, so you wouldn't get eaten by a crocodile you know it's so, it, the things that we don't necessarily have to worry about here that other places have to consider um yeah yeah so and, and, and just uh, yeah. Go ahead. Another as um, a, a conference president in uh, one of the central conferences, he told me, he said, you know, we, because of the seasonal rains that we have, he said, there's during the dry season, they can't baptize anyone because they don't have water holes that they can use. There just isn't, you know, creeks or water holes. And he said, they have people that they have to 
they have to wait for six months before the rains come enough to um, have a water hole that they can then baptize in. So he was wanting, you know, one to be put in um, in his district. So that just is an example of the needs. Yeah. And we're primarily focusing on churches in poor regions where the need is great and agriculture helps provide a means. We don't want to just give money. It's like Confucius said, if you feed a man a fish, you feed him for a meal, you teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. So we're setting them up with the agricultural tools, you could say, and a Dagragana gives them the knowledge of how to grow and then they're able to generate income to support the church work in their in their region. So that's that's one of the blessings of this project. There's many, many worthy mission projects, but as soon as that project is complete, uh, the hand is out again because there's need of more money because they don't have income generating um, industries and so on to, to help keep the work going forward. So this is, I think, one of the, the big blessings that this provides. You know, and, and, and that's one thing I, I like to mention here for anyone that's listening, you know, the, the Adventist Agriculture Association, at least the U.S.-based version of it, um, you know, we're not necessarily interested in having a monopoly on control. Like the, the, the people in Ghana, they just said, that's a great idea. We want to do that there. And, you know, we're more interested in, in, the, in the message of, of Adventists getting back into agriculture and what that means, being as widely disseminated as possible. Not necessarily that our organization, our particular nonprofit is interested in controlling all that, but we wanna help anyone that is interested in doing that. I believe um, you've, you've actually spoken at, uh, at a the Un-Adventist Agricultural Association conference in, uh, in Australia. And I know there's one in Europe and now in Ghana, and I believe there's one in Brazil. I'd actually love to call all these different organizations and talk to their leadership and, and bring it on here so that everyone kind of, you know, knows what each other are doing because it's a great workout yeah. there. And, um, you know, we're all tied by a common thread of, of food um, and uh, kind of uh, solidarity and wanting to help all of us learn how to do that more effectively and, and to receive the blessing of it. Um, that, that would be a great thing to do. I think we should try to pull that together. I think it, it would be possible. Yeah, you, you know on, people over there better than I do, but hopefully hopefully we can have some some more uh, great conversations. Yeah, so. something else I haven't told you, Ellen, I don't know if you want me to say it on this video, but sure. we were talking about all these different regions where Adagra has been established. I Because I've been to um, Jamaica and- That's right, uh, got Jamaica to, too, yeah. I got to know uh, one of the union um, pastors who's over the health work there. And it's not just for Jamaica, it's for the Caribbean islands. And so he called me, um, I'm going to say within the last two weeks. And um, he was on a, he had a bunch of leaders from different Caribbean islands. And uh, they had had a discussion about how they need to get the church involved in agriculture. And so they're talking about starting a Caribbean Adagra and they want to, you know, see uh, God's work uh, blessed by that over there. And um, they've already, uh, it sounds like they're already just, you know, trying to kick the ball along a little bit and get something started. And um, I was invited to go to Granada. Um, so, yeah, we'll see how the Lord leads. But uh, definitely, there are many places around the world that once they know that, you know, and see what's being done, mm -hmm. are going to be excited to get on board with uh, Adagra. And, and form well, maybe you can help connect me up and, and we can we can do an interview with them. I think that would, yeah. be, that would be really awesome. I might actually have you if you're willing to come on and, and be a part of that interview, because since they've been in discussion with you, it'd be neat. You'd probably know more of the inside scoop to be able to ask questions and such. Um, Absolutely, be happy to. Let us uh, let us end with the word of prayer, and then I'm gonna just talk a little bit about our next. And you can just hang on, Mr. Greenfield. I'll just make a little bit of comment on our on our next interview that we're going to be having. Um, but uh, could you close us with a word of prayer? Sure, be happy to. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, you're an amazing God. You pour out rich blessings upon us that uh, we don't deserve, but 
you love us, you love your people, you love those who are needy, especially those who are in desperate situations, and you want your church to bless and help and relieve and, um, and make a difference. And Lord, we thank you for what you're doing through Adagra. Uh, it's exciting to work with you in these projects and to see how you uh, raise this organization up for such a time as this. And so, Father, we pray that you'll continue to bless this work and lead us forward, that you will bless those who are listening to uh, this uh, video. And we pray that um, you will continue to lead us and, and show us how we can be involved in, in uh, reaching more areas of the world and, and places that still haven't heard your message. We know that uh, the whole world has to hear it before the end will come. And um, you've given us a, a great responsibility to do this. So help us uh, through Adagra to do our part to make this possible and uh, to hasten Jesus coming, we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. So just a little, a little kind of teaser. Our, our, next, our next interview is going to be with um, Anna Perea. Angela Boosby and Melissa Clayton, they are the three people that are heading up the um, Adventist agricultural curriculum, which is basically targeting, I believe it's, I believe it's K through 12 and then high school, basically having um, a curriculum that you can do agriculture and also teach, you know, other skills and um, like it can in some ways maybe take over uh, some other curriculums, especially for younger kids, but it's the emphasis is with agriculture learning practical skills. I might be a little bit off on all that, but we'll be getting all the details as far as kind of what that curriculum looks like, why it got started, why Ad Ad Adagra is um, really looking forward to supporting it and seeing this curriculum created. And we're going to be talking to Melissa and Anna that are writing it. And then obviously Angela has been heavily involved in, in getting contacts um, at many different levels of the church and uh, that are hopefully going to review and support it. And we'd love to see it get into our schools in the United States. And obviously, Mr. Greenfield, you mentioned that I guess the, the school, at least over there in Ghana, is excited at least initially at looking at it. Um, we might need a, a, a tropical, it looked pretty tropical over there. I wonder if we need to make a, a tropical edition or something, you know, for different climates or whatnot. Um, yeah, we might be able to get them to adapt it, you know, and then. Yeah, with with all the expertise over there, that might not be so hard to do um, mm -hmm. with the quality of people. So that hopefully will be um, what our next uh, interview will be on. And so hopefully um, you were all blessed by this. I definitely was. I, I, I've i talked here and there with Mr. Greenfield about what he's been doing over in Ghana and helping out there. So it was neat to get a, a much broader picture of the whole scope and um, if you like this video um, um, please subscribe and um, and also make a comment on the bottom and, and let us know um, maybe other people that we should think about interviewing and and other things that are going out there we really want to uh, develop the youtube channel for ad agra as a platform to really um, disseminate the uh, information and what other people are doing so that we can all learn from each other because if someone has figured it out in one area to do a certain thing. Um, we want other people to be able to glean that information and, and to be able to apply it and maybe just get networking going on so that you don't just hear us once a year at, at a conference, which I should say, maybe you're, you're coming on here and watching this video. At Agra has an annual conference that happens in January um, where in the United States this year, it's going to be in a place called Wonder Valley. It's about 30 minutes um, east of Fresno, California. Um, you can check out more details on that at our website, AdventistAg.org. Um, and that will be happening in January of 2022. We already had ours this year in Glenrose. Um, and for, for those of you that know about Audioverse, uh, the audio just got uploaded from that conference if you're interested in, in checking that out. And we're hopefully going to be uploading audio onto our YouTube channel so you can check it out uh, here as well. So with that, thank you so much, Mr. Greenfield, for taking the time. And uh, I, I hope to maybe in a year, uh, a few months, or when you go back, maybe we can bring you back on, do another interview and uh, get an update on how it's going and, uh, and what the Lord has been able to accomplish over there. 
Sure, I'll be happy to. Okay, well, I'll chat with you later and uh, see you everyone in the next video.